The year is 1959, the dawn of the space race. The Soviet Union has taken an early and commanding lead over the Americans with their ability to reach Earth orbit, the moon, and beyond. In an effort to demonstrate their technological superiority to the world, the Soviets bring out their latest and greatest spaceflight hardware on an international tour. Meanwhile, in America, the CIA is working hard to capitalize on an opportunity. This is the first time a Soviet rocket has ever been outside the fortified borders of their union. America's top spies are given one impossible mission. Get your hands on the Soviet hardware and reveal their secrets, but the enemy must never know that you are there. This is how you steal a spacecraft. Here is the state of the space race at this time. In October 1957, the Soviet Union put the first satellite into orbit, Sputnik 1, using the power of their R-7 rocket booster. Then, just one month later, they launched a second satellite, and this one had a dog on board, the first animal to orbit the Earth. In 1958, they launched Sputnik 3, weighing in at 1.3 metric tons. It carried a wide range of scientific instruments to study the upper atmosphere from space, for the first time. In 1959, the Soviets launched a successful mission to the moon. Their Luna 2 probe became the first man-made object to impact the surface of the moon. Then again in 59, Luna 3 flew straight past the moon, taking the first ever photographs of its far side. Over this same time period, the United States answered Sputnik with the first launch of their own satellite, the Vanguard TV-3, in December 1957. The rocket booster ignited and lifted off about four feet above the ground before the engines cut out, then the whole thing fell back down and exploded on the pad. By February 1958, the USA would find success with their Explorer 1 satellite. It was a humble little spacecraft. Here's a full-scale Explorer 1 being held up easily by three men. Remember, just a few months prior, the Soviets had successfully launched a dog inside a capsule to orbit. Explorer 2 was lost after the upper stage engine failed to ignite, the whole thing just falling back down into the ocean. But the US was undeterred. Explorers 3, 4, and 5 were quick to follow in the summer of 58. Explorer 5 failed to reach orbit after the first stage booster crashed into its own upper stage payload. America then pivoted to the Pioneer program. These were ambitious spacecraft designed to reach lunar orbit and test new concepts for future crewed capsules. Again, when you look at the Pioneer spacecraft compared to human scale, you realize how small these things really were. From August 1958 to November 1959, the USA launched five Pioneer missions, all of them failed to reach orbit. So hopefully that illustrates the situation that the American government was experiencing in the autumn of 1959. The Soviets were winning, but success was making them cocky. In an effort to capitalize on their newfound global attention, the Soviet government organized a traveling exhibition that would showcase a number of their most cutting-edge technologies, vehicles, and equipment. Among the displays, of course, would be a spacecraft. The Soviets chose a Lunik probe as the crown jewel of their exhibition, nearly identical to the Luna 2 that had reached the surface of the moon just weeks prior, and Lunik would be showcased inside the upper stage of the mighty R-7 rocket. CIA officers in plain clothes took their first opportunity to visit the exhibition and get a close-up look at what they had assumed would be a scale model of the Soviet lunar probe. But when they looked through the glass windows into the spacecraft, they quickly realized that this was no model. This was the real thing. Soviet technology ripe for the stealing. It wouldn't be as easy as sneaking into the exhibition hall after hours. The Soviets did have their own men guarding the probe at all times when on display. So the CIA turned their attention to how the goods were being transported from one city to the next. Everything was packed into wooden shipping crates and moved by truck to the local rail yard where it was then held overnight before loading onto a freight train the next morning. It was the only time when the Soviets let their guard down. This was the opportunity for CIA agents to covertly intercept and kidnap the Lunik, study it overnight, and return the cargo to the Soviets who would never know that it had been gone. 
In the 1950s and 60s, Mexico City was a Cold War hotbed for spies, assassins, and revolutionaries. Both the CIA and Soviet KGB had heavy intelligence operations in the area, and Mexico was chosen as the location where this would all go down. CIA operatives got their hands on a Soviet shipping manifest. It listed a crate with the right dimensions for the Lunik that was labeled as Models of Astronomic Apparatus. They had their target. As the exhibition was being taken down and packed up in Mexico City, the CIA used inside men to ensure that the crate with Lunik inside would be the last one to leave the grounds en route to the train yard. Fortunately for the CIA, the Soviets were hiring local trucks and drivers instead of using their own men, so as the last truck left the exhibit, American agents positioned their own cars in front and behind. Once they were satisfied that no Soviet assets were following the truck, the plan was put into motion. At the last turnoff before the rail yard, the truck with Lunik on board was pulled over. The driver was removed and sent to a hotel overnight, where we imagine he was informed by the CIA that if he didn't want any unfortunate accidents to befall his family, then he best keep his mouth shut about that night. An American driver took the freshly hijacked truck to a nearby salvage yard that had been chosen for its high wall to obscure the spy's activities. Again, we assume the local owner was persuaded to cooperate. Once inside the scrapyard, the truck was covered and the agents hunkered down to wait and see if the enemy suspected anything was wrong. At 7 p.m., the Soviet official at the rail station who was receiving the trucks made the assumption that everything had arrived. He then packed up and went to dinner. He was followed to his hotel by CIA agents who kept up observation all night. There is also an unofficial story out there that all of the Soviets responsible for the exhibition were treated to deliveries of alcohol, LSD, and prostitutes at the hotel that night to ensure that they remained distracted and disoriented through the operation. At 7.30 p.m. with the coast clear and under the cover of darkness, the CIA set to work. The first task was to remove the roof of the crate. The wooden top was held down with five-inch nails that had already been pulled and rehammered several times over as the cargo moved around the world, so no need to cover their tracks here. CIA agents who were specialized in rocket hardware dropped down into the crate, which was six meters long and four meters deep, just large enough to hold the rocket stage, and they had only socks on their feet to avoid leaving any prints behind. After taking photos and measurements of every visible component, the team started removing everything that they could to see what was inside. The plate that covered the main engine compartment was held down with 130 bolts. With the cover off, they found that the engine had been removed, but its mounting brackets, as well as the fuel and oxidizer tanks, were still in place. Agents swabbed the tanks to sample fuel residue. The orb-shaped Lunik probe itself was held down with a plastic seal that had been made with a Soviet stamp, kind of like a wax seal on an envelope, seemingly put there as a tamper-proof measure. If the Soviets found their seal broken or missing, they would know that someone had been messing with their hardware. Undeterred, the kidnappers broke the seal and removed the probe from its payload cradle and began to disassemble it. The Soviets had been smart enough to remove most of the electronics from the probe, but they left behind two electrical couplings that were taken by agents for detailed analysis. Now, this is the CIA we're talking about, so of course, by the time they had put Lunik back together, agents at the Mexico City station had made a perfect reproduction of the Soviet stamp, the probe was returned to its cradle, and a new seal was put in place. By 4 a.m., agents had put the entire spacecraft back together, meticulously removed any signs that they had been in the crate at all, and replaced the lid. At 5 a.m., a CIA driver moved the truck from the salvage yard with a canvas cover over the top. They brought the truck back to the point where it had been hijacked, removed the cover, returned the original driver behind the wheel, and the truck pulled into the railway station. When the Soviets returned to the rail yard at 7 a.m., they found the truck with the Lunik cargo waiting for them. And for whatever reason, maybe their heads were still spinning from a wild night of partying, maybe they just didn't care that much, they checked in the crate as if nothing was wrong and loaded it onto a rail car. Now, this story comes from a classified CIA report written in 1967 entitled The Kidnapping of the Lunik. 
In it, the author makes note that, to this day, there has been no indication the Soviets ever discovered that the Lunik was borrowed that night. Maybe they didn't notice, maybe they just didn't care enough to make it known that they did. Besides, what could the Americans really learn from a small probe and the upper stage platform of a rocket with no engine, right? Well, it turns out the CIA wasn't specifically looking to uncover engineering secrets. Their primary concern was identifying Maker's marks on as many of the components as possible. They wanted to know who was building this stuff and where they were doing it. Doesn't sound like much today, but the Soviet Union at the time was a massive nation and there was virtually no way to know anything that was going on inside its borders. So any insight into how their manufacturing economy was functioning would be valuable to the United States. By measuring and weighing the captured rocket stage, it also helped NASA to understand the capabilities of the Soviet R-7 rocket booster. Could it really be as powerful as the Soviets had claimed? At this time, the R-7 rocket dwarfed anything that the Americans could come up with, and most of the rockets that the Americans did manage to build were not only less capable, but they also had a tendency to explode more often than not. The Soviet R-7 was so incredibly engineered that it's still in use to this day, rebranded and updated to become the Russian Soyuz rocket booster. So it must have seemed unfathomable to the Americans at the time that Soviet engineers could really be that far ahead, but they were. The CIA figured out that the mass of the upper stage and payload that they captured was around 8 tons or 18,000 pounds. At the same time, America was having trouble getting 100 pounds into space. When they compared the payload weight against the radar measurements that they had made of the velocity of the R-7 in flight, they concluded that the rocket was every bit as capable as the Soviets had boasted. NASA reasoned that the Soviets' existing booster was versatile enough to be paired with different upper stages that could put men into space and send missions to the Moon, Mars, and Venus, which is exactly what the Soviets would go on to do. This information was all declassified in 1995 after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and what it really shows is the lengths that these two players in the space race would go in order to find an advantage no matter how small.